Hello, this module, module one, which is about chapter one, is all about describing a system or a flow. Uh, in this particular part, we are going to cover what is known as equilibrium and the local thermodynamic equilibrium hypothesis and, and kind of describe a few properties, define a few properties of states. Okay, so let's begin with an animation of a very complex general systems, general system. So as you can see in this animation, we see an open, open system where fluids are going in, coming out, and there is electrical work transfer, uh, shaft work transfer, boundary work transfer, and heat transfer. In other words, if you go over the red boundary, you can see all types of interactions between the system and, in, and the surroundings that we covered in the previous chapter. Now our task is all this interaction, how they affect the state or the disk, how they affect the system. And to understand that, we must be able to describe, describe a system mathematically. So that's our task. So this is a very complex system. So imagine to describe it, all the colors here are describing different kinds, different properties at different points, etc. So what would be a mathematical, systematic way of describing the system? To do so, we must first understand what is known as equilibrium. For that, let's isolate the system. What do I mean by isolation? Number one, we plug the holes so that the system becomes closed, no flow anymore. We, we let the shaft and electrical work stop uh, transferring work, the, even the piston stops. And as we wait for some time, we'll see that all the differences inside, hot and cold, you know, high motion and slow motion, everything is going to subside. In general, in, a, in, a, in an active system, you'll find there is a thermal difference, thermal difference meaning temperature difference between point to point, there can be a velocity difference, and there can be even chemical difference, which means there is a possibility of chemical reaction. When all these internal differences disappear, after the system is isolated, if you wait long enough, all these differences will disappear. And the system then achieves what is known as thermodynamic equilibrium. That means when, when it's in equilibrium, that means no, no properties of the system will change. The, the description becomes frozen. So why is this important? A real system, you can imagine, it's not frozen. Things are changing in a pump. You think of a pump or a compressor or a turbine or an electric lamp. You find that everywhere things are changing. So why are we after equilibrium? That's because if you, that's because if you think of the global system, Again, everything is changing, but if you, if you go to a local system, let me just stop and talk about it. What I mean by that is that suppose the system is dynamic, everything is changing everywhere, but suppose we scoop out some small local system from different places of this big, large system. And that's being shown by the animation here. Suppose we scoop out a little fluid from here, a little fluid from there, we isolate them, then what will we see? We'll see that ultimately we'll, we'll achieve an equilibrium here and here. It so happens that even in a dynamic system at a given location, a system achieves equilibrium. In other words, if suppose you have a look around you, suppose the air in your room, suppose one part of the air is hot in one corner, another corner is colder, what local equilibrium means that if you scoop out a little amount of air from one corner of the room, isolate it, isolate that air, then you can find that it has a certain pressure, temperature, density, etc. What local thermodynamic equilibrium means is that that's always true. At any given point, that equilibrium exists. From point to point, that equilibrium can be different, but at a given point, 
even though things are changing at a given amount of time, at a given time, if we just can measure pressure and temperature at a given point dynamically, at that time, pressure, temperature, density, they are all describing a particular equilibrium. And the entire room is kind of a collection of different equilibriums. And that's what makes thermodynamics such an important subject. Because then now we can, a complex system we can describe as a collection of equilibrium. That's an hypothesis. In other words, we are saying, you know what, if a gas is in equilibrium inside a jar and there is a relation between pressure, temperature, and density, let's say ideal gas equation connects them, then even though the gas is flowing through a turbine, if you just scoop out a little gas or if you measure the temperature and pressure at a given point in the gas, then that relationship we find from equilibrium will still apply in the dynamic system. Try to appreciate that. And that's at the heart of thermodynamics. That's what makes it such a practical subject. Okay, now let's go and define a few different kind of systems. Just let me see where it is. Okay, here it is. 1A, systems classified. So this is a very complex system. And there, here is some adjectives that are used to describe systems. Open means mass flow is allowed, mass, mass interaction is allowed. Unsteady, this is an open, unsteady, non-uniform system. Unsteady means at a given point, things can change with, with time. Suppose you put a pointer somewhere, you'll notice the color is changing. That means the properties are changing there with time. And that's called an unsteady system, if that happens in even a single point inside your system. Non-uniform means from point A to B, there is maybe a difference. If you take any two points in the system, things can, could be different between the two systems. The description could be, the local description could be different. So you can see in this animation, if you make the system closed, that means well, there'll be no mass transfer. Uh, if, it is, if it is steady, suppose it's an open and steady, that means at a given point, things will not change with time. All the colors are frozen. Notice there is no change of color at a given point. Similarly, if it's uniform versus non-uniform, uniform means point A to B, things can be different, but unsteady means things can change with time. So as you can see, there is two possibilities in each case. So two times two times two, there are eight possible systems. So a given system can be, can be one of these eight kinds. So we have to come up with a methodology in which we can describe all kinds of systems. So we begin by, by going back and, and, and revising some of the properties of systems that we already uh, know from our prior experience. So we begin there. Okay, so let's go and st start building up on what we know. Suppose we consider a system and the first property that we all are very familiar with is the mass of the system. So mass is M is the symbol, unit is kilogram. What does it mean? It's the amount of matter. We all know that. But let's go a little bit deeper. Suppose, let's think about the same system and a different kind of description of the ma amount of matter, right? So a system would be, in our, in our uh, language, a system will be always made up of molecules. In other words, Molecule is the smallest part of the system. Think about it. You take a system, you break it up into small, small pieces. The last part that still represents the system will be called a molecule. Let's assume from the, for, the, from, for the time being that we have a pure substance, which means the, the molecular composition doesn't change as you go from point to point. So let's say we have some water inside my system or nitrogen gas, etc. So that the molecules are all the same. It's a pure substance. So in that case, one way to describe the amount of matter is the mass of the system, so many kilograms. Another way is to describe it by the number of molecules. And that property, if you recall from your chemistry, the number of molecules or the count of molecules is called the mole 
and it's represented by n. Well, if you really count, it will be so such a large number. So, just like we count x in dozens rather than exact number, we can always multiply by 12 to find the exact count of x in a big container. Similarly, molecules, we count in what is called in the unit of, and that's the confusing part, mole or kilomole. Notice the spelling. Mole is the property and the unit is MOL or kilomole. Uh, how much is a kilomole? One kilomole, just like a dozen, everybody knows what a dozen is, is 12 and a kilomole is 6.023 and you tend to the watt. You must be thinking 26, but no, this will be 29 because I'm talking about kilomole. At one mole is 10 to the 26 and kilomole is 10 to the 29. This number is not really important here. Important thing is that we can describe the mass, the amount of matter in a system in terms of mole n or mass m. Either description is fine. And obviously, because the molecules are identical, the mass of one mole is a constant. Right? It makes sense. Must be a material constant, right? Think about it. What is one mole? One mole means so many molecules, a big dozen. We'll call it a kilomole, it's like a big dozen, a big dozen of molecules. Molecules are identical, so no matter how you, which dozen you pick, they'll have the same mass. So mass of one dozen of molecules must be the same if the molecule is pure substance, suppose it's hydrogen or nitrogen, etc. So that is called the molar mass. Molar mass is, I'm, I'm calling it by M bar, what is molar mass? Mass of one kilomole. So M by N kg per kilomole. So this becomes a good formula for us to convert mass and mole. What is the relationship? Because molar mass is a constant, so therefore, uh, if I use that formula, N is M by molar mass. This is probably you're more familiar with. So molar mass of CO2, for instance, is 44 kg per kilomole. Molar mass of hydrogen is 2 kg per kilomole. Molar mass of oxygen is, say, 32 kg per kilomole. Again, there is table. Some of table will, in the future, will encounter, which will have all this listed. But a few of them is good to know. Why do we put a bar on molar, ma molar mass? Uh, okay, it's because whenever the unit happens to be per kilomole, we'll make it a habit. That way, you'll find that later on, uh, you know, it will be really helpful. So N is given by so many kilomole here, where M is the mass in kg, and M bar is the molar mass in kg per kilomole. So this will become an important relation later on. But I just want to give you a quick example of how we can use this formula to find an average molar mass of a substance. Suppose somebody says, suppose, how do you find an average molar mass? Suppose we have a tank and we put, let's say, inside there we put uh, 2 kg of hydrogen. Suppose we put uh, 16 kg oxygen. Well, this is that. What is the total mass here then? 18 kg. Very simple. So if somebody says, "What is the total mole? What is n here?" Of course, the total mole is what it's made of hydrogen. How many mole of hydrogen is there, and how many mole of oxygen is there, right? And you can see that mole is mass by molar mass, so it should be two divided by. What is molar mass of hydrogen? A molar mass of hydrogen is 2 plus 16 kg of oxygen. Molar mass is 32. So it's 1 plus 0 0.5, 1.5 kilomole. So in this, in this tank, 
we have 2 kg of hydrogen, 16 kg of oxygen, uh, total 18 kg of mass, and 1.5 kilomole of matter. That means how many molecules are there. So if somebody says, suppose hydrogen and oxygen are kind of mixed together, it's not like they're separate in the tank. So even if you take a small local system, there are trillions and trillions of hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules in there. But their proportion is always the same no matter where you take the scoop. So this qualifies as a pure substance in thermodynamics, which means for all practical purpose, it will work like a pure gas. With a molar mass, which is m divided by n, you recall, of 18 divided by 1.5, which is, mm, if I multiply by 2 both sides, 36 by 3, 12 kg per kilomole. See if that makes sense to you. Okay, we'll, we will stop here uh, so that you can take a break and come back. And in the next part, we are going to discuss more properties that you are already familiar with. And then our goal will be to put them together, classify them so that we can systematically describe a, a given system.